When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Now, it's hard to follow Hosea. But if I had to pick a prophet to do it, Joel is not a bad choice. The book of Joel, with his three brief chapters, is all we get from him. I wish we had more. We'll see him scattered elsewhere in Scripture. When Peter quotes him, for example, when the restoration fulfills some of his prophecies. The tricky part about the book of Joel is we don't know when it fits. Uh, Like I said, most of these so-called minor prophets are clustered around the destruction of the northern kingdom in Israel or the destruction of the southern kingdom of Judah. Are the Assyrians the enemy? Are the Babylonians the enemy? Let me know. Well, the hard part about the book of Joel is he never mentions the Assyrians or the Babylonians, and that would have been helpful to place him chronologically. Instead, he talks about enemies like Philistines and Phoenicians and Edomites and Egyptians, and so some scholars say, oh, it must be beforehand because those were some of Israel's earlier enemies. So some place Joel as the first of the minor prophets. But then again, he also mentions the Greeks, and they're the later ones. So some say, well, maybe he's the last of the minor prophets, because the Greeks are an enemy by then, post-Persian period. Then some say, well, maybe some of it was written before, and some of it was written after, and uh, it's just one big confusion. He's one of the minor prophets that's hardest to, to, to date. But maybe that's a good thing, because he seemed to care a whole lot more about our day than his day anyway. And so much of his writing is focused on the last days. We saw some of that in Hosea. That's the day when finally the family comes back together. Joel will do similar things. So as we turn to the book of Joel and see what he's writing, how please see his message directed to you very personally. He was a prophet with his eye on the last days. Chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, ye old men. Give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? In other words, has anything like this ever happened before? Well, tell your children of it. And let your children tell their children, and their children, another generation, The message I have to share are things that have never happened before and things that you will want to pass down generation to generation to generation. Does that sound like he's trying to get us prepared for these final days? These are words that need to be passed down. Verse 4, that which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten. That which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten. That which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. Now, there's some disagreement here. Are, there, are these four different species of insect? Palmer worm to locust to canker worm to caterpillar? Or others say, yeah, King James translators, they should have known their locusts a little bit better. Maybe there are not many locusts up in London. Because these might simply be four different stages in the life cycle of a locust. Either way, what he's describing here is mass devastation. If if you know your early church history, think about the plague of grasshoppers in Salt Lake that were gobbling up everything, and the seagulls had to come in to save the day. Well, there's no seagulls for this one. This is an absolute locust uh, infestation to the point that what one cycle or stage left behind is just gobbled up by the next, or the next, or the next, until there's nothing left. This could fit in well in the days of the Assyrian destruction. It could fit in well in the days of the Babylonian destruction. Or the destruction by the Romans. Or the destruction at Armageddon and the end of the wicked world. That's why Joel is so applicable and relevant throughout history. But here's the message, if this is what is bearing down on you. Verse 5 through 7. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. 
For a nation is come up upon my land strong, without number, whose teeth are as the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste, and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare, and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. This is complete destruction. So forget the locusts. Were they literal? I don't know. doesn't matter. But there is a literal enemy on its way bearing down upon you, and you better wake up, you sleepers. You better get sober, you drunks, because it's time to prepare. In fact, it's past time. Couldn't you hear the buzzing of the locusts off in the distance? Aren't these prophets trying to raise a warning voice? Are we changing and preparing? Verse 8 through 10, lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The meat offering and the drink offering is cast off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn. The field is wasted. The land mourneth, for the corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up. The oil languisheth. Connecting the temporal with the spiritual here, no wonder there's no offerings at the house of the Lord. The people have nothing to offer. There's nothing left. A meat offering, all the animals have died. A grain offering, it's all been eaten up by the locusts. Do we have anything to give God? Or has our wickedness consumed all of that till we have nothing left? If so, verse 11 through 12, be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen. Howl, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine is dried up, and the fig tree languisheth, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree. Even all the trees of the field are withered, because joy is withered away from the sons of men. This is imagery of absolute devastation, of drought, of famine, of sorrow, of mourning. These are dark days that Joel is describing. Do they sometimes seem fitting? For the world that we live in? In verse 13, gird yourselves and lament, ye priests. Howl, ye ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God. For the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. So much focus here in Joel on worship, on offerings, on the temple, which again would point us to these last days. Think as we get closer and closer to Armageddon and temples dot the earth as pinpoints of brilliant light that shine against a backdrop of devastating darkness. These are the last days that Joel is describing and trying to prepare us for. He says in verse 16 through 18, Is not the meat cut off before our eyes? Yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seed is rotten under their clods. The garners are laid desolate. The barns are broken down, for the corn is withered. How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. Now, I probably could have skipped a lot of this and just summarized it from the start, saying, hey, there's this locust infestation. There's this destruction and devastation until there's nothing left. And that's pretty much what he'll say for the rest of chapter 1. That's true. That's a good, quick way to summarize Joel chapter 1. But to hear it, to read it verse after verse after verse with all the lamenting and all the howling, all the shame, all the devastation and destruction it starts to weigh on you by the time you get to the end of this chapter. You start wondering, is there any hope ahead? Any better days or have we passed the point of no return? Are we staring down the barrel of Armageddon and this is the end? Well, if so, look at the end of this chapter, verse 19 and 20. O Lord, to thee will I cry. That's the solution. That's our only hope. For the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of waters are dried up. The fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. These are the fires of consequence, and they are burning everything in their path. If only there were rivers of water, rivers of living water, to put out these fires. 
to quench their thirst. Think about Ezekiel's vision of a river of living water flowing out from beneath the temple. Think about John the Apostle's visions at the end of the book of Revelation, where rivers of water flow out from the tree of life. That's what we're hoping for. It's what we're waiting for. It's what we're preparing for as we're digging wells and praying for living water to spring up within us unto everlasting life. That is our only hope in these last days. And those are the days that Joel describes even more graphically in chapter 2. Verse 1 and 2, he says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Picture those ram horns. And, and there they are. If the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, Paul says, who will rally for the, for the battle? Well, this is a clear sound. The trumpet in Zion is sounding an alarm from the holy mountain of the Lord. Watchmen on the tower, looking out, seeing afar off, the enemy gathering and coming. What are they saying to help us prepare? He says, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Perfect description of the last days. These days of trouble and gloom. General darkness in need of pinpoints of brilliant light shining from the tops of these mountains of the Lord. This is the prophet, the watchman on the tower, trying to rally the troops. And it's been amazing, even these last few years, to hear President Nelson as the Lord's watchman blowing a trumpet in Zion, sounding an alarm from the holy mountain. How's this for a quick review? April of 2018, his first general conference. In fact, even before that, he's sounding an alarm to stay on the covenant path. He invites us to increase our capacity to receive revelation, to minister to the one. He asks the youth to join the Lord's battalion to gather scattered Israel. Six months later, the trumpet sounds again, October of 2018. Create a home center church. Gather Israel on both sides of the veil. Fully take upon yourself the name of Christ both individually and institutionally. Six months later, April 2019, he blows the trumpet in Zion again. Embrace a life of repentance. Focus on the covenants of the temple. How's that for an alarm from the holy mountain? Six months later, October 2019, access the power of God in your life. Seek the treasures to be found only in the temple. Serve all those around you in need. Six months later, April 2020, put faith in Christ into action and hear him. Two-word trumpet blast that has been echoing ever since. October of 2020, never stop preparing. Let God prevail in your life. April 21, remove the spiritual debris from your life. Have faith to move mountains. October 21, strengthen your spiritual foundation. Make time for the Lord. April 2022, build your spiritual momentum. You'll need it to push your way through the last days. And then October 2022, overcome the world. Come out, ye that be clean, ye that bear the vessels of the Lord. What an alarm from God's holy mountain. What a trumpet from Zion. Do we sense our, the timetable? Do we understand what we're up against? And are we willing to live worthily and righteously in the last days? In verse 3, Joel says, a, a fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. Oh, we're surrounded here. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. We're going from Eden to Armageddon. We're going from abundance to barrenness from peace to war, from love to hate. It was, it was Eden before. And then this marching host, these, that's why locusts are such a great metaphor for it. Because they're just, I mean, it's a, one of the plagues of Egypt. They're going to consume everything in their way. What looked like Eden ahead of us, as we then march through it, looking for whatever scattered kernels might remain it's Armageddon in the rearview mirror. 
How will we live? In verse 4 through 6, the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and as horsemen. So shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth a stubble. As a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. Have you seen Lord of the Rings? Or even better, read it? These massive battles... Oh, the siege of Helm's Deep, the final battle at the city of the king. And to see the, the armies of the orcs spread off as far as the eye can see. Oh yeah, I think my face would gather blackness. I think I would look pained and afraid. What are we to do against such odds? How do we raise righteous children in a day of darkness? How do we shine as lights in the world? How do we navigate exile in Babylon? In verse 7 through 9, they shall run like mighty men. This is charging, like fearless warriors. They shall climb the wall like men of war. So even your walls can't keep them out. They shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Talk about order. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk everyone in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. I mean, picture this army never breaking ranks. And even as they're coming to, to rush upon our fortifications, they don't break the battle lines. In fact, they don't even get wounded. Is there anything we can do? He goes on, they shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. There is no stopping them. Again, there's the locust imagery. Have you ever seen a f film or footage of a flock of birds or of bats or of insects that are just swarming and moving? And it's amazing because they don't like run into each other. They don't like fly and, and hit and then fall to the ground. It's this whole moving swarm. And that's the army that's being described here. The army that we're up against. Like we talked about in the book of Daniel, that there's not a part of your life that Babylon doesn't want to control. So it brings its generals and its captains and its rulers, but also brings its treasurers and its judges and, and everything else. And here... I'm not trying to scare us, but not, well, maybe I am. Maybe Joel is. Maybe he's trying to paint a picture that's bleak enough, dark enough, that we will beg for the light of the world. That we'll realize, as Elder Maxwell has said, that this is a real war with real casualties, spiritually speaking. Or as Elder Holland has said, if we are, Christ if we are casual Christians then we will end up being Christian casualties. That's stark language. Last days, yes. Joel is trying to prepare us for them. Please take this seriously. Verse 10 and 11, The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Do those phrases sound familiar? These are the signs of the times. And we're in those times. But the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. So it's not just the orcs out there. The, the Lord has an army of his own. For his camp is very great, and we're a part of it. He is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? That's the question. That is the question of the last days. In fact, that's John's question in the book of Revelation. Chapter 6 of Revelation is incredible because he marches you through all these dispensations before the final one. You go uh, galloping forward with the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You kneel at the altar of martyrs that symbolizes the fifth seal. See, the first four horsemen, first thousand years, second, third, fourth, the fifth is the martyrs, the fifth thousand years. The sixth thousand years, the one that comes right before the millennium, the coming of Christ, how is it embodied? How is it symbolized? Because each thousand-year period, each millennium gets its own symbol. 
Four of them are different colored horses. The fifth is an altar. What's the sixth? This is a little less clear, but if you read what John d- describes, the one overarching symbol for this thousand-year period preceding the coming of Christ is earthquakes. It's the shaking of the earth. It's the shaking of faith. It's earthquakes in diverse places. It's even mountains and islands fleeing and moving out of their places. Those were places of safety. Kings would build their, their castles on the mountaintop. Or they would dig a moat around it to turn it into an island. Those are the places of security. Well, where do I go for safety if even the places of security are looking for security and running away? Where can I stand firm if the world around me all seems to be shaking? I felt strongly about naming this channel Unshaken when we first started it two years ago. Because I pray we can make it through our days of shaking and be able to stand. The way Joel ends this question or ends this verse, who can abide it, is the way John ends Revelation chapter 6. Who shall be able to stand? That is the question. The answers start coming in verse 12. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and turn is repentance. So please repent with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. That's real repentance. That's broken heart and contrite spirit. That's inward and not just outward. It's too easy to tear your clothing. No, you need to tear your heart. Do it on the inside. Internal sackcloth and ashes. How's that for real repentance? And what would cause us to do that? What would give us the confidence to do that? Nothing but a knowledge of God. And so Joel goes on. For he, God, is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. The JST, he will turn away the evil from you, therefore repent. And who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him? And then Joseph adds, that ye may offer even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. He'll finally have something to give him again. What I love about those verses, 12 through 14, we know what we're up against. We saw a whole chapter about it. And the, and the locusts are bearing down upon us. But if we turn to God with all our heart, if we rend our heart and not just our garments and give him that broken heart and contrite spirit, then we'll be preserved. We're his people after all. He will carry us through. We're his army, and this is a general that refuses to lose the battle. We just have to know that about him. Because what's keeping me from repenting? Falling prey to those misperceptions that God is angry and mean and vengeful? No, we read Hosea. We just did. (laughs) Okay, Here in Joel, if we know his mercy and his grace, his kindness... The desire that he has to leave a blessing behind him. What what do the locusts leave behind? Armageddon. What does God leave behind? A return to Eden. He'll reverse the whole thing. That's the promise. That's faith unto repentance, as the Book of Mormon calls it. Because if I have faith in those attributes of God, then of course I'm encouraged. I'm reassured. I'm invited. I can come to him. He will let me. We then read in verse 15 through 17, some more trumpet blasts, another alarm sounding. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children. You get a sense here? He's kind of bark, he's barking out these orders with very simple commands. Fast. Gather. Solemn assembly, sanctify, assemble, get together on this. Let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. It's marriage time. The ten virgins, how many of you are ready? Bride and and groom, Christ and church, Jehovah and Israel coming together. 
Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? It sounds like Moses pleading with the Lord back in the wilderness of Sinai. Please, God, forgive them. Give them another chance. Don't destroy them out here. Or what will the people think? What will the surrounding nations think about thee and thy people? Joel is making similar intercession. And to understand these trumpet blasts, these alarms, just asking us to prepare and to repent and get the earth ready for the second coming of Christ. The wedding feast is about to begin. He then says in verse 18 through 20, Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. I will no more make you a reproach among the, the heathen, but I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea and his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. <laughs> the Lord will finally defeat his enemies and deliver his people. That northern army, that's where the Assyrians will come from. That's where the Babylonians will come from. It's where the Greeks will come from and the Romans will come from. Okay, the wicked world is bearing down upon us, but the Lord will remove them far off. And to feel protected from the wicked world, to feel safe within the sanctuary of standards, to enter the house of the Lord with its thick walls that keep the world out. Oh, those are places of safety, places of security. He says in verse 21 through 24, Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. He's doing them already as we speak. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, the latter rain in the first month. It's going to come. It's going to be okay. The floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. That is the opposite of everything he just described before. About all that desolation. Uh, with, with fire spreading in every direction, and the armies out there trampling everything down, and the locusts spreading until there's nothing left. And yet now... The rain has returned, and with it, blossom and bud, with it, corn and oil and wine. This is a land flowing with milk and honey all over again. God has reversed. The war is over, and peace can return. He says in verse 25, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. The canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, the whole thing. I'll reverse the entire devastation. I will restore those years, those lost years. My great army which I sent among you, and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. My people shall never be ashamed, and ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel." and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. What a promise. Everything lost will be found. The fall will be reversed. The apostasy will end in a glorious restoration. Death swallowed up in victory. Not a locust left. These are such powerful promises. And how does it come about? Notice verse 28 and 29. It shall come to pass afterward, so at some future day, these latter days, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my Spirit. 
those days, those latter days. My spirit poured out on all flesh, old and young. There's the young men and the old men. Male and female, there's the sons and daughters. High and low, low, there's the servants and handmaids. It's not just one type of person. It's everyone. This is the knowledge of the, of the Lord covering the earth as the waters cover the sea. This is every knee bowing and every tongue confessing. This is no more need to teach your neighbor, thus saith the Lord, because everyone knows the Lord. Can you imagine getting to a point where missionary work is no longer necessary because everyone already knows? We're not at that point yet, <laughs> not by a long shot, but that's the goal. And how do we get there? By living worthy of the Holy Ghost. There's that fascinating passage in section 11 of the Doctrine and Covenants that says, and if, if you desire, you'll have my spirit and my word. The convincing of the power of God unto the convincing of men. If you desire, who wouldn't desire that? Well, sadly, by our actions, sometimes we show that we don't desire the Spirit to be with us. But if we can live in such a way where God can pour out His Spirit upon us and upon all flesh, then of course we win the war. Of course darkness is eclipsed by a flood of light because we're all following the light of the world. Every son, every daughter prophesying which is more than just, well, just, it's not a just, more than predicting the future. That is a subtopic in the gift of prophecy. The book of Revelation describes the gift of prophecy as the testimony of Jesus. Imagine if every son and daughter had the testimony of Christ. Oh, old timers are dreaming dreams. The youth are seeing visions. That's a literal fulfillment in Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith Sr., an old man dreaming dreams. Joseph Smith Jr., a young man having visions. Sons and daughters prophesying. A young woman in Italy, Madeline Cardin, who has a dream of messengers coming, sent from the Lord to her little alpine village and bringing the fullness of the gospel. And so it happened a decade or so later as Lorenzo Snow and his companions climbed the Alps and found the Waldensians. That's how my family joined the church. It all began with the Spirit being sent upon the old and the young, on men and women, boys and girls, sons and daughters. That's how the work will continue to go forth. Until verse 30 through 32, the final day comes when I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. That is such an important prophecy. That is the end times. That is the last days. Those are the signs of the times. Blood, fire, smoke, darkness, a great and dreadful, great and terrible day. But safety where? In Mount Zion? Deliverance where? In Jerusalem? New or old? That's the remnant that the Lord is calling. And that remnant is returning to the covenant of Christ. That is God sending out his word and his sheep hearing the voice of the good shepherd. That is gathering Israel on this side of the veil, even as we do it on the, on the other side of the veil as well. That, this is what we're doing. This is the day that we're living in. Back in October of 2001, we heard a trumpet blast uh, from the mountain of the Lord when Gordon B. Hinckley stood up in general conference one month after 9-11. That same conference, he turned around and was handed a slip of paper and, and then read to the audience, the congregation there in the conference center, that the bombing had just begun as the war in Iraq had be, was beginning. 
It was an intense time, as you all remember, who were old enough. But in his talk, President Hinckley said, as he's describing the war in heaven that has been transferred to a war on earth, and as wars and rumors of wars, I've never heard a better description of terrorism than that, as that was spreading, as darkness and destruction, it was an intense time. It felt like the last days, still does. But in that context, President Hinckley stood up and said, the vision of Joel has been fulfilled, wherein he declared, and then he quoted the end of Joel 2, like we just did, about the Spirit being poured out on sons and daughters about darkness and devastation and blood and fire and smoke, but about Mount Zion and about Jerusalem. And which side will we be on? Will we be the righteous remnant? I remember some friends at the time thinking, whoa, did you hear President Hinckley? He just called it out. He checked off the box on Joel chapter 2. So, I mean, is the second coming any day now? And I remember thinking, well, yes and no. No man knows the day nor the hour, but there are signs of the times that are being fulfilled. And I'm a prover of contrary, so I want to be prepared, but I don't want to be overzealous. I want to be prepared and patient all at the same time. Uh, I want a slow and steady spirituality rather than a fanatical faith. And so I pointed out that, yes, President Hinckley checked that box, but... There's a lot of boxes uh, because Peter checked that box too. Way back in Acts chapter 2, when the Spirit of God was poured out upon the people at the day of Pentecost, then Peter said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he quoted Joel chapter 2, verse 28 through 32. I mentioned the layer cake idea with Isaiah, that he would make a prophecy that was fulfilled in his day and in Christ's day and in the last day. Well, Joel was a pretty good baker, too. And so consider that Joel's layer cake, and it will have multiple fulfillments stacked one on top of the other. Yes, in Peter's day. Yes, in President Hinckley's day. But does that mean it's all said and done? Or is there yet some blood and fire and smoke to come? Or more importantly, more visions, more dreams, more prophecy, more spirit being poured, about, poured out upon every son and daughter of God with an open heart to receive it. Those are the last days. Those are the best days. That's the great to push back against the, ter the, the terrible. And I pray to be a part of it. In fact, we are invited all to be a part of it. And that's where chapter 3 comes in. I, as much as I love the end of Joel chapter 2 with that incredible prophecy, Joel 3 has some of my favorite phrases in all of Scripture. He begins in verse 1 and 2 with an, a look to the last days. For behold, in those days, the latter ones, and in that time, the end time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Now part of that passage probably makes sense. Bringing again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Oh, well, that's a gathering of Israel. Gathering all nations. Oh, that's beyond Israel. But remember, gathering Israel is only the first step. He only chooses a chosen people so that then they go out and choose everyone else to be chosen as well. So we're gathering Israel, and then non-Israel is going Jew to Gentile. And you understand, all of this is happening. But then the end of it, where is he going to bring us? To the valley of Jehoshaphat. And there he's going to plead. In fact, there he's going to judge, because that's what Jehoshaphat means. Jehoshaphat means God judges. And so think about the gathering at the end times, and then God passing judgment upon the people as he separates wheat from tares and sheep from goats, right hand from left hand. What's interesting, though, also about the valley of Jehoshaphat, he was the king of Judah back in the days of Elijah and Elisha. Elijah and Elisha were preaching in the north. We don't really have any record of big-name prophets in the south. Well, good thing we had a big-name king that, unfortunately, we don't remember often enough. 
Jehoshaphat, especially if we skip Chronicles and only study First and Second Kings, then we really miss out on Jehoshaphat because, I mean, you might want to go back and re-listen to those, uh, those episodes because in Second Chronicles 17 through 20, you get four whole chapters where you really see the reign of Jehoshaphat unfold, and he's incredible. Not perfect. He was a little too trusting of Ahab up north, but he was incredibly trusting of God, and that was the good news. That's the strength side of that other weakness. But in that trust, when enemies are around them and, and there's an alliance coming down against Judah, King Jehoshaphat declares a fast. He invites the people to pray. He gathers them to the temple. Does this sound like some of the trumpet blasts we've been hearing in the book of Joel? Gather a solemn assembly, sound the trumpet from the mountain of Israel. Jehoshaphat is, the, is just the guy to do that. And he gathers them. Well, the Lord takes care of the battle as he always does. And in victory, Jehoshaphat then gathers his people together into a valley that he calls the Valley of Beracha. And Beracha means blessing or blessedness. So when we think of the Valley of Jehoshaphat, it's got all kinds of identities. One, it's a valley of judgment because God is going to judge the enemies of Israel and defeat them. He's going to judge the people of God and preserve them. He's going to grant them a blessing. So this valley of judgment is also a valley of blessing and blessedness. And that's where this gathering in the final day is going to be. And again, think more metaphorically rather than just one solitary valley out there somewhere. Okay? Hold on to the idea of a valley as we keep reading moving forward. Verse 3, They have cast lots for my people, and have given a boy for an harlot, and sold a girl for wine, that they might drink. Now talk about dehumanization and even commodification. This is the wicked side of things. They're just casting lots. They're gambling over other people. Uh, for a, a harlot, they're giving a boy? This is, this is shocking. They're trying to satisfy the lust of the flesh. And how do I pay off the prostitute? Well, take this, this boy. Or how do I pay off my debt at the, at the bar? What does the bartender want? We'll take this girl, sell the girl for wine. So give the boy for the harlot, cast lots for my people. This is a scary time. This is Babylon that we find ourselves surrounded by, where people have been dehumanized and commodified in our preference for commercialism and consumerism and people don't matter, but how do I get stuff? Now keep reading, verse 7 and 8, Despite all that, behold, I will raise them out of the place whither ye have sold them, and will return your recompense upon your own head. How's that for passing judgment upon them? I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hands of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabaeans, to a people far off, for the Lord hath spoken it. That last line can be a little confusing unless you caught the, the shift that he's no longer talking about his people, he's talking about the enemies of his people. I'm gathering my people away from the enemy. And then what does that left you enemy to do? To be, have your sons and your daughters sold off. There's the role reversal. There's the poetic justice as God passes judgment in the valley of Jehoshaphat, Jehovah judges. This is, you scattered my people. Well, you'll know what it feels like. This is back to that enforced empathy we see running throughout the Old Testament. You'll know what it's like to be scattered because you scatterers will become the scattered yourselves as I gather my people home. So verse 9 through 11, Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Now this is intense, because this is a reversal of Isaiah chapter 2. Remember the promise in Isaiah 2 was millennial peace. And so you take your sword and you beat it into a plowshare. I don't need this to fight an enemy. I can just use this as my plow to break up the clods of dirt on the ground. My, prune, my spear, I don't, I'm not going to throw it at anybody. But it's on a long pole and it's sharpening, and that would make a good pruning hook as I'm just pruning the trees and the high branches. The weapons of war are now becoming implements of agriculture. 
so I can feed people instead of fight them. That's a beautiful prophecy. This is the opposite. It's a scary one. You're going to need every sword you can get your hand on. So go take your, your plowshare and somehow turn it into a weapon instead. Take your pruning hook and that'll become a pretty good spear. Now he's speaking to the Gentiles. Prepare for war. Wake up your mighty men. If it's a fight you want, it's a fight you'll get. But the Lord will preserve and protect his people and cover them in the armor of God. This will be a righteous remnant ready to follow the Lord of hosts into battle. Don't take things so literally that this becomes some kind of martial heading off to war. But in terms of fighting the powers of darkness in high places. Yes, put on the whole armor of God and get ready for the fight of your lives. It's one that will win as long as we stay on the Lord's side. But that's the choice before us. So he says in verse 12 and 13, let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. This will be the valley of judgment. For the righteous, it will be the valley of blessing. For the wicked, not so much. What will he do there? Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. This is the field is white already to harvest. This is the wine vat is red already to be trodden. This is... He hath trampled out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. This is the Lord coming in robes of reminding red, having trodden the winepress alone and staining all of his raiment. This is the second coming, and he's coming to the valley of Jehoshaphat. He rephrases it in verse 14 with, with one of the most Oh, to me, one of the most powerful symbols you could ask for in Scripture. Because in light of all this talk of valleys, the valley of Jehoshaphat, the valley of judgment, the valley of blessing, in verse 14, he renames it one last time. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. You see what he's done by, by rechristening it? This is the choice that the last days will set before you. It's a great and dreadful day. Which do you prefer? It is no more middle ground. It is choose you this day because it's the last day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is Elijah against the priests of Baal, wondering how long halt ye between two opinions. If the Lord be God, then follow him. But if Baal, follow him. This is choose a side and dive in the trenches because the bullets are flying and middle ground is no man's land. We have to make up our mind in the valley of decision. And so here we stand, multitudes, multitudes, making the decision of a lifetime, a decision of the eternities. The rest of this chapter builds off of that with more signs of the times, but this is the time, the time to choose. He says in 15 and 16, the sun and the moon shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining. This is a day of darkness and we have to be the light. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion. How's that for the lion of the tribe of Judah? He will utter his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth shall shake but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. This is the Lord seeing us through the shaking of the last days. This is him steadying us and helping us stay on our feet. In 17 and 18, so shall ye know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. I'm right here with you. Then shall Jerusalem be holy. And there shall no strangers pass through her anymore. No more strangers or foreigners, only fellow citizens with the saints. It shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine, 
The hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth out of the house of the Lord, and shall water the valley of Shittim. This is the river of living water that Ezekiel saw, that John prophesied of, the river of living water that should come from every temple. When the side of Jesus himself was pierced, what came out of his temple? Not just blood, but living water. And for that to come forth as we come unto Christ, as we come to know him in his holy dwelling, in his mountain, flowing with milk and honey, flowing with wine and milk, come and buy it without money and without price. Just come. That's the place of safety amidst all this destruction. It's the place of light amidst the darkness. And then the chapter ends. Verse 19 through 21. Egypt shall be a desolation. Edom, a desolate wilderness. For the violence against the children of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. There's judgment being passed on Israel's enemies. But what about God's friends? What about his people? Judah shall dwell forever. And Jerusalem from generation to generation. For I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed. For the Lord dwelleth in Zion. And those are Joel's final words. So similar to Ezekiel's final words that speak of the, the, the city, the new Jerusalem, getting a new name. Simply, the Lord is there. Here the Lord dwelleth in Zion. He lives here. He stays here. And the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. The millennium begins. Satan is bound a thousand years. Children grow up without sin unto salvation. The Lord himself wipes away every tear from every eye. You understand why I would be so eager for the second coming to come? Why I want to spend my days preparing the earth for that glorious day? That I'm so grateful every time a trumpet blast sounds from the holy mountain. A clarion call for us to change, for us to choose the Lord. Because here we are, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. What kind of choices will we make? That valley of decision is the valley of Jehoshaphat. It's the valley of judgment. It's the valley of blessing. But it's also a literal valley, and that's the Kidron Valley. The Valley of Jehoshaphat has long been associated with the Kidron Valley. And if you're not familiar with the Kidron Valley, look for it every time it's mentioned in the Old Testament, and you will see the place where righteous and reforming kings, like Josiah, like Hezekiah, like Jehoshaphat, would take their, the pagan idols that the people had set up and destroy them, melt them down in the valley of Kidron, a valley of decision, a valley of judgment. In the days of the Passover, when countless lambs without blemish were slain on the Temple Mount, the blood would be funneled off the Temple Mount and would flow down through the Kidron Valley, turning the brook Kidron blood red as ultimately it empties down into the Dead Sea. On the Day of Atonement, when you perform the scapegoat ritual and put Israel's sins on the head of an innocent animal and then lead it out of Israel, where? through the Kidron Valley, once it crosses the brook Kidron, it's heading out into the wilderness of sin. Now those are all Old Testament references to the Kidron Valley. Keep looking for it when you get to the New Testament. And what's the most important geographical feature in the Kidron Valley? It's the Garden of Gethsemane, where the scapegoat went, where the blood was channeled. 
where the Kidron, where the brook Kidron flowed a blood red. And a solitary figure went to tread the winepress alone, where a king of Israel destroyed the idols of our apostasy, where rivers of living water will flow and ultimately heal the Dead Sea. Multitudes, multitudes, where are we? We're in the Valley of Decision, and that's Gethsemane. And can you imagine how different your decisions would be if you made every single one of them, spiritually speaking, right there in the garden, knowing what your decisions would cost the man that paid the price for them there. When Moses set before them life and death and said, please choose life, when Joshua entered the promised land and in a valley of decision between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, had the tribes of Israel split so they could shout curses and blessings across the valley. So there, as I sit or stand in the middle I have the choice before me, and it is brutally clear. This is Abraham setting up his altar between Bethel on one side, the house of God, and I on the other, the ruined world, and with a decision to make, where will I go? That's the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's the valley of judgment. That's the valley where Christ made it possible for us to change. But that's the valley of decision. And my prayer for all of us, myself included, is that with Joel's voice ringing in my ears, with the Spirit of God filling my heart, with young men having visions and old men dreaming dreams and sons and daughters being filled with the Spirit of the living God, I pray I will choose wisely. I bear my testimony that someday the Lord will come in robes of reminding red that someday the final box of the prophecy of Job will be checked. And then we'll be checked to see how we've lived our lives. I am grateful for tender mercies. I am grateful for a Lord who never gives up on straying saints. But I invite all of us to come unto him to enter the valley and to look at the consequences on both sides and to choose, to choose wisely. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision.